Good morning. Welcome to worship here together today as Shawnee Park Christian Reformed Church. A warm welcome if you're here with us in person or if you're joining with us via the live stream this morning. We are gathered for a time of worship on this third Sunday of Easter, the season sometimes called Easter Tide, because the good news of the resurrection of Jesus needs at least some weeks to resonate in our hearts and in our lives. We're going to worship together today um, in song, in prayer, in word, and in sacrament. And we want to say, if you're a guest worshiping with us today, and you are from a church family where you would ordinarily partake of the bread and the cup, then we warmly welcome you to participate with us, too, as a sign of our unity together in Jesus. And if you're a guest for whom that's not the case, then we would ask that you um, refrain from taking the bread and the cup, but participate in all the other parts of the service in a kind of hopeful anticipation of a time when we could meaningfully share this bread and this cup with you in faith in Jesus. Uh, we are going to turn to a new series in our worship uh, focused on Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. I'll say more about that when we come to the, uh, the scripture lesson and sermon for the day. But we'll begin with a word calling us to worship from Psalm 95. I invite you to rise as able and join where indicated as God calls us to worship through these words. I'll just do six <laughs> Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God. And a great king above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it. And the dry land, which his hands have formed. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture. And the sheep of his hand. O oh, that today you would listen to his voice. That psalm calls us to come and bow our hearts, our lives before God, and to hear and heed his voice, and that's just what we've gathered here with God's help to do today. And it's God who welcomes us into this time and place of worship. May the grace of our risen Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God the Father, and the abundant fellowship of the Holy Spirit all be yours. Amen and amen. Come, let's continue our worship together in song.
You may be seated. Beautiful songs, beautifully sung, telling of the holiness of God and our, our joy and delight in all he has created and all he has done for us. And among the chief of those things that God has done for us is through Jesus Christ to reconcile us to himself. And so we turn to this time of confessing our sins and receiving again the message of God's forgiveness here and consider these words from 1 John chapter 3 as they call us to come to Christ that our sins might be taken away. The apostle writes, everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that Christ appeared so that he might take away our sins. And in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. And no one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. And so let us humbly come before God looking to Christ, confessing our sin, acknowledging our need for a savior. We'll begin with a, just a time of silent prayer, conclu concluded with a general prayer of confession spoken together. Let's turn to God in prayer. Continuing our prayer together. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us amend what we are and direct what we shall be so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. And here is that same apostle John proclaims to us good news and calls us to look to our new identity in Christ Jesus. The apostle writes, See, behold, what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God. And what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Thanks be to God and all God's people said, amen. This morning's offering is for Kevin and Julie Girton uh, with YWAM. Just to let you know, too, that this is kicking off a series where we are going to be giving every week to uh, a specific missionary. So next week, um, actually, I don't remember who it is, so <laughs> stay tuned to find out. <laughs> let us pray. Heavenly Father, we graciously come before you with these gifts physically in the plate here today or given online this week. Please use these gifts to further the ministry here at Shawnee and also the ministry of the Girtons with YWAM. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks, Sarah. Just a couple of notes before we continue our prayers. Um, one is that yesterday uh, noontime here in the parking lot, there was a distribution of the food truck. I got the 
final tallies that, uh, by estimate, about 393 people will receive food from that uh, in 102 different families. And those folks were served by a team of 21 volunteers who helped to distribute that. So thanks to those of you who served in that way, and we'll pray God's blessing on those gifts, that they may be signs of God's goodness and favor to those who receive them. A couple of other notes um, as we turn to prayer. One is an update on Perlene Bivens, who has been um, home and under hospice care for the last couple of weeks. Perlene has done um, surprisingly well by uh, doctor and hospice nurse accounts. Uh, she's surrounded by a lot of loving family and has um, continued to have some appetite and be able to have conversations with her family. Uh, even so, they anticipate that um, she is coming to the final days of her life, but um, we're grateful for all the, the days and hours they have together, and we'll continue to pray for them. And then, uh, as you may have heard, Joven Manon is home after some days in hospital and rehab, uh, slowly improving. We'll pray for her continued care. And then also note we're praying today on what is uh, noted as Abuse Awareness Sunday as we pray for um, the church and our lives uh, that God would give us wisdom as we uh, address matters of abuse in our neighborhoods, communities, church, and world. We're going to pray today um, from uh, a prayer based on Psalm 4. Let's join our hearts together and pray. O oh, faithful and righteous God, as we seek you in worship this day, as we call to you with our prayers and petitions now, as we receive your word and as we in a few moments gather at this table, Christ's table, we pray and ask that you would come, come and graciously answer us. Come and grace us anew with your presence and favor. Wherever we are in distress or trouble, have mercy on us, O Lord. Faithful and righteous God, what should be our glory and our delight, our constant walk with you, is so often dismissed or ridiculed in the world around us. And at times we are allured and tempted to look in many directions for our help and our hope. But we gather this day and join our prayers in this hour that we might again acknowledge you, O Lord, as our true help and hope to acknowledge that you have set us apart to be your faithful people and that you have promised to hear when your people call to you. Oh God, we pray that you would teach us through all our worry and our frustrations to turn in trust to you. When in the nighttime we are at times consumed with worry, when fearful and fretful voices fill our minds, calm our hearts again. By day, by night, teach us to lay all things before you and to wait and trust for you to act, to heal, to redeem, to comfort, and to renew all things. In that spirit and with that promise before us, we lay our requests before you this day. We pray for those in our community who are burdened by illness and injury today. Have mercy, we pray, upon Jove and Manon as she recovers now at home. Have mercy upon Mary Jane Van Lu and Craig and Rita and others who deal with ongoing matters of health and injury. We pray your mercy especially on our sister Perlene Bivens as she is surrounded by her family as these days um, stretch out. Give them many moments of grace and goodness together, even as they surround her with love, surround her with your own love and favor. O oh Lord, throughout the world, human hearts and voices and nations cry out in search of goodness, of life, of prosperity, of peace, of justice. Hear their cries, O oh God, and let the light of your face shine upon the nations of the world. Bring peace and goodness, we pray. Bring your peace and goodness in the midst of the too frequent abuse that exists in nations, in communities in homes, in schools, and in churches, too. Lord, wherever there is manipulation and violence, where innocence is preyed upon, where the vulnerable are taken advantage of, of rise up, O oh God, to defend and protect and shield, to hold accountable, to heal what is broken. And make us, we pray, people and communities of refuge, 
and wisdom and healing. O God, let the light of your face shine upon the nations of the world where there is ongoing violence and strife. We pray again this day for the land of Israel and the peoples of Gaza. As war seems to only escalate, we pray that you would restrain the violence and the destruction. We pray that cool, calm, and peacemaking heads would prevail. We pray also and again for the people of Ukraine, for the people of Myanmar, and for other places and nations where there is political and civic strife. Guide lawmakers locally, nationally, and globally to work diligently for the causes of liberty and justice and for the common good. And let the light of your face shine upon us too, O God. Let us see and receive your goodness and your beauty on display. When we see the blossoming of spring, when we see the mystery and wonder of the, wonder of the movements of the heavenly bodies in this week's eclipse, and when we see the many joys and blessings of our life together before your face. We give thanks that in receiving your goodness, we're also at times able to minister it to others. Thank you for the distribution of food in our parking lot yesterday. May it truly be a blessing, a sign of your goodness and faithfulness and love to those who receive it. May it not only fill empty pantries and bellies, but fill hungry hearts that are longing to know you. God, we ask that the peace that passes understanding, this radical contentment through life's joys and struggles, through seasons of plenty and seasons of need, would be ours as well, so that when we lie down to sleep at a day's end, we may rest in your peace. For you alone, O Lord, are our help and our hope, our rest and our reassurance. And so we pray all these things by the Spirit's guidance, and in Jesus' name, amen. As we prepare to open God's word together, we're going to sing a prayer of preparation, a Christian's daily prayer. I invite you to rise as able as we sing and pray together.
invite you to turn then to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5. We've been in the Gospel of Matthew for a while now, reading through many of Jesus' parables, and then through Holy Week and uh, Good Friday and Easter, reading from Matthew's Gospel. And now we're going back to um, one of the most famous parts of Matthew's Gospel, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Today we're going to read just the the first few verses of that sermon, uh, chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. That's on page 785 in the Pew Bible. There we read, Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. Blessed are the poor in spirit, For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I just realized I don't have my clicker. That's a mistake. Do we have one sitting around here? Front pew. Um, I don't see it. Oh, wait, it's over here. Okay. A quick test to make sure it's working. It is. Wonderful. We're in good shape. We are in the season, as I noted, of uh, Easter tide, a few weeks uh, beyond Easter Sunday. And um, upon reflection, it seemed like a good time to consider thinking about the ramifications and implications of Jesus Christ's resurrection. And to do something else as well, uh, a few years ago, the leadership of this congregation set about to refresh and restate the mission and values of this congregation. And what came from that um, starts with a a simple statement of who we are. So let me just show you that a moment. Who we are. It says, Shawnee Park Christian Reformed Church nurtures and extends God's family. And then it gives these three um, expressions of that. We gather in unity as God's church where every person from first-time guest to lifelong member has a place. We grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ through joyful worship and thoughtful study. And we go in peace to love and serve our neighbors, our city, and our world, inspired by the Holy Spirit to seek restoration and renewal. Now, I was not part of the process of putting that statement together. That's before my time here. But what I hope to do in this season is uh, explore it a bit. Um, to let the the good news of Christ's resurrection sort of resonate out as we consider again some of these statements and do it especially through the lens of Jesus' most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, because it too is a statement of who we are. Our guide and teacher in these things, of course, is Jesus. And this Sermon on the Mount is as good a place as any to ground our understanding of who we are as his disciples. It's in, as we noted, Matthew chapter 5, and of course uh, that means there's four chapters that come before it. Those are chapters in which Matthew told of Jesus' birth and a couple of stories from his childhood and told of the ministry of John the Baptist and then of Jesus' baptism and then his temptation in the wilderness. And then we get, after all that, this statement where it says, from that time on Jesus began to preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. He began to teach. And the fuller description of his teaching is this Sermon on the Mount. It's also an extension of what he has just said in calling his disciples. He said, come and follow me. And as they followed him, they were inducted into his teaching. So if we, too, would want to be followers of Jesus and know who we are as part of his kingdom, to know what it means to be repenting for the kingdom of heaven is near, then we would want to attend to his teaching here as a definitive statement of who we are. And then as along the way, I hope to come back to this who we are statement as a congregation and see how some of its words and language get uh, given definition and clarity and shape in our lives through Jesus' teaching. 
So tonight, uh, today, I want to look with you on kind of three aspects of uh, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, where it begins, and what it says about who we are, who we are. And I'll start with this. We are a mountain people. Um, Many of you are aware that between Easter Sunday and today, uh, I had a week of vacation, and I, with family and some friends, went and did some hiking up in mountains, Smoky Mountains specifically, of Tennessee. Um, And if you know me a bit, you know something of my affinity for mountains. I spent some time growing up in uh, Colorado, and just enough that mountain kind of got in me somehow. So sometimes you hear people say, well, there are beach people and there are mountain people. And some people at spring break look to find the best beach they can get to. And some of us look to find mountains. I am firmly in the mountain column. Okay. But I know not all of you are, and that's okay. Jesus does a lot of teaching by the lakeside, out in a boat, by the beach. But here, most famously, he teaches from the mountain. And I want to say to you that we are a mountain people, a sermon on the mountain people. Um, in Matthew's gospel, there's, there's a number of key mountain moments. There's the moment where Jesus is on the mount and he is transfigured before his disciples and Elijah and Moses appear with him, a revelation of Jesus' glory. There's the Mount of Olives where Jesus, before his crucifixion, crucifixion wrestles in prayer and submits to this plan. And then there's the mountaintop scene at the end of Matthew's gospel, after his resurrection, in Matthew 28, and I just want to look at that passage a minute. Oh, that's a, that's a mountain picture. This is what we did. We hiked up to mountains and mainly waterfalls. Got some pictures like that. But in Matthew 28, uh, Jesus says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. That is uh, perhaps the definitive statement of the church's mission and its identity. And Jesus' disciples would go from that mountain encounter, empowered by the Holy Spirit and Jesus' ongoing presence, to do just the things Jesus said, baptizing people of all nations and teaching them to obey everything Jesus has commanded And along with the everything Jesus had commanded that had to drive them back time and again to Jesus' teaching here in Matthew 5 through 7, this Sermon on the Mount, they had to become a mountain people in this sense. They had to become lovers of Jesus' teaching. Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, um, if you've read through it, you can read through it in probably 15 minutes or so. Uh, You can memorize it with a bit of work. Um, I did that at one time. I probably wouldn't do very well... uh, at this point. But it is such a powerful, definitive, shaping statement. There are so many um, aspects of Jesus' teaching that are so foundational that come out of this, this sermon. And for centuries, followers of Jesus have looked to this moment, something like the Israelites looked to the mountain on which Moses received the law. And the covenant between Israel and God was, was formed, and God's character and revelation were given. And then these statements of what covenant faithfulness looked like. What does it mean to be God's people? And that, in that context, the law was given. And Jesus is doing something like that. I note that in um, the first couple of verses in Matthew here, it says that it's when as crowds gathered that Jesus went up on a mountainside and his disciples came to them. So both the place of the crowds and the disciples, which would be to say that this sermon is both for those who are committed followers of Jesus, but it's also for the crowds, those who might be considered curious seekers. I note that um, our Shawnee Park statement says that we are here to nurture and extend God's family, that we're to be a community both to nurture those who have committed to following Jesus, to help them grow in that, but also to extend that family out, to be inviting curious seekers and neighbors and friends. So, That is to say, if you're hearing Jesus' words today and you're hearing this message, then this message is for you, whether you are in the committed disciple or the curious seeker or feeling somewhere in between those two. What Jesus is going to go on to lay out is nothing less than than high and holy teaching about a whole way of life for a whole community of people. 
This is a, a mountain sermon in the sense that it, it expresses a very high view of our calling in Christ Jesus. And as a mountain people, it, it expresses something of what we're going to aim and point ourselves to as we follow Jesus. So we're a mountain people, first of all. And then you can't escape it. The key word here in this section is that we are also a blessed people. Blessed is the word that gets repeated again and again in this opening section. Blessingness, or uh, often called the Beatitudes, the blessing. Nine times this word blessed occurs. The word in Greek is a rich one. Sometimes uh, some translators have gone with happy. And there's a sense in which that captures something and there's a sense in which that uh, might throw us off and lose something. There's a sense in which the term is, is related to an Old Testament concept where you look at and you try to describe what a good life is. An admirable, an admirably good life. A life that in a way is enviable. Uh, Psalm 1 does this. It says, happy is the one who doesn't walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of the mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and on God's law meditates day and night. That person's like a tree. A person with that kind of life is admirable, is happy, is blessed in this sense. Happiness, uh, it wouldn't be a bad uh, translation in many respects. Whose life do you look at and say there is a, well, you'd have to say like a deep happiness about it. I picked up over vacation a, a little book by the comedian Paula Poundstone. Uh, I was not reading it and planning for this sermon, but it seems to fit. She wrote a book called The Totally Unscientific Study of the Search for Human Happiness. The Totally Unscientific Study of the Search for Human Happiness. And in that book, Paula Poundstone tries uh, a number of different things. Different chapters all rec represent different experience. She's going to experiment. She's going to try all these different things that she's heard can lead to a happy life. You'd say a good life, an admirable life. So she tries vigorous physical exercise, though it's not really her thing. She tries spending more time with her many pets. She's a cat lover, and she has lots of them. She tries, at one point, just trying watching movies all day long with her kids. She tries a period of life where she tries to get thoroughly organized, you know, really get rid of the clutter and get rid of a lot of stuff and get really organized. She tries renting a sports car for a few days and driving around in it. She tries dance classes and silence and meditation classes. She goes on a backpacking trip. And after she's tried all these things and found varying degrees of actual lasting happiness through them, she comes to a last chapter and she makes this observation. She says, happiness is more complex than I realized. Happiness is more complex than I realized. She says, you know, there is a, a kind of happiness that's pretty shallow and pretty brief. And maybe a better word for that is just fun. Driving a sports car is fun. Watching movies for a day is fun. But it doesn't really translate to this thing I'm actually after. What I'm actually after is a deep happiness. Something that lasts, that endures. I think that would be closer to the sense here in the Sermon on the Mount. What Jesus is expressing is a, a blessed, a happy life, an admirable life that is deep and that endures. It is more, it's something more, that by happy, we, we might first think about our own emotional state. Do I feel happy? But what Jesus is describing is something different and other than our emotional state. It's more a statement of, of God's state of mind than our state of emotions. It's more a statement of which way of life has upon it sort of the divine or Jesus' own seal of approval. That's good news in, in one way because it means it's not for us to try to sort of gin up and manufacture certain kinds of feelings. We don't have to feel especially happy to live into this opening section of Jesus' sermon. Someone has called them uh, the Beatitudes, be attitudes. Be like this, be like this. But it can be hard to kind of work yourself into a, a certain kind of attitude or frame of mind. Someone else called them, I like this a bit better, be beautiful attitudes. Jesus is holding before us a, a way of life, a good life that is beautiful and admirable and will be drawn into it as we follow him. 
It's good to say, too, I think, that these Beatitudes are not a, a list for us to pick and choose from. It's not a buffet where you're going to have a little bit of poor in spirit and a little bit of hunger and thirsting for righteousness. It's not describing eight or nine different kinds of people. It's describing eight or nine characteristics of one group of people, those who have committed to follow Jesus and participate in his kingdom. So we are a mountain people, and we are a blessed people. Jesus is pronouncing a way of life and a blessing upon those whose lives reflect that. And in this opening, these opening few of the Beatitudes, blessings, Jesus says we are a blessed people, especially in our emptiness. There are many statements of what an admirably good life is out there. There were in the ancient world as there are. There's lots of attempts like Poundstone to, to discover what, what a really deeply, truly lasting happiness of life might look like. But when Jesus begins to describe it from his perspective, it's pretty counterintuitive. It's pretty surprising. There are, as I said, eight or nine, depending on how you count them, beatitudes. And this first grouping, this first grouping of four, says that those are admirably happy and blessed and are living a good life who are poor in spirit, who are mourning, who are meek, and who are hungry and thirsty for righteousness. This is deeply counterintuitive. We would expect so much more, someone to say, how admirable and happy is the life? I mean, if you, if you called someone up on the phone and simply asked them, what does the good life look like? What would you describe? How would you know if you were living a good life? And people would probably naturally think of, well, I would hope I would have uh, a job that's uh, meaningful and that I enjoy and that um, provides. I, uh, I guess it would be meaningful to have good and healthy and right relationships in my life, whether that's marriage and kids or friendships or uh, I would want to have uh, good relationships and um, you know I might like to travel some um, what kinds of things would we think we would think a meaningful a good life would represent a certain degree of prosperity and power and yet Jesus points in a very different direction we just touch on each of these opening statements a little bit, um, mainly on the first one and then just briefly on the others. But Jesus begins by saying, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Remember that Jesus said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. And now he's going to describe this way of this kingdom, the kingdom of heaven that is for those who, Jesus says, are poor in spirit. The term poor in spirit has been um, broken down and analyzed in different ways, and I read and listened to some different interpretations, but I'll, I'll give you my best sense of it. That the word poor basically means poor, means impoverished. It means, uh, it's a term that tends to indicate an intensity of poverty, like the poorest of the poor, those who are just at the end of their rope, and those who are poor in that way in their spirit. The phrase points us to people who are utterly abject, who've lost it all, who are at the end of their rope, those who are stuck in the mud and can't pull themselves up by their bootstraps because they don't have any boots. They are the people who are most likely and most commonly overlooked and forgotten. These are not people who make it into the history books. They are often miserable. They have nothing to offer. They fail and they feel their failure. They are weak and dependent and incapable. How happy are those folks? How admirable, what a good life, those who are so broken down in that kind of way. And yet for Jesus, this is where it starts. There's probably a good reason this is the first one. To come to Jesus and to be his follower requires in a kind of uh, entryway that you, that you get low and small. That you acknowledge your own helplessness and your great need. Poor in spirit when Jesus says it is mainly a description of the people he's looking out on. He has not gathered among the crowds or his disciples the, the powerful, the well-to-do, those who are capable, the, the movers and shakers of the world is not who has gathered at this mountainside with him. 
And this will be true in an ongoing way of Jesus' disciples. It is so often those who are powerless in this world who are most drawn to Jesus' different kind of power. This is a good word for uh, those of us who do not find ourselves often living among the poorest of the poor in the world. We are much likely, much more likely to, add, to, to admire something we might call middle class in spirit. Right? Pastor Tim Keller uh, and writer talks about this in his book, Generous Justice. He says, if you're middle class in spirit, you believe that God owes you some things. He ought to answer your prayers and to bless you for the many good things you've done. You feel that you've earned a certain standing with God through your hard work. You may also believe that the success and resources you have are primarily due to your industry and energy. That would be to be middle class in spirit. But then he contrasts it with poor in spirit, which he says is something more like this. It means seeing that you are deeply in debt before God. And you have no ability to even begin to redeem yourself. God's free generosity to you at infinite cost to him was the only thing that saved you. God's free generosity to you at infinite cost to him was the only thing that saved you. That we did not come to Jesus because we were so bright and figured it out. That we did not continue to walk in Jesus on our own strength and energy and resources, but, but there's something about being gathered to Jesus that draws you into admiring a poverty of spirit. Poor in spirit, and then Jesus also says, blessed are those who mourn, they'll be comforted. This speaks to those who are brokenhearted, uh, maybe in a general sense, um, certainly those who, who mourn and grieve, it's the, the, the term is related to those who mourn and grieve over death, as we do when we lose a loved one. But it seems to expand out from there, Jesus is drawing on some of the Old Testament prophets to talk about those who mourn and grieve, especially over the sin and evil and brokenness of the world and the sin in their own lives. That those who are, and these seem to kind of go together, those who are poor in spirit will, will grieve and mourn the brokenness of the world and in self. Jesus says also, blessed are the meek, they will inherit the earth. Meekness has something to do with a, a gentleness, a humbleness in heart. These are those who don't make demands for themselves, who are often willing to let others have the first, the best, or the most. Blessed are the meek, how admirable and good is their life. And then blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. This would be about those who in their poverty of spirit and mourning and meekness have this longing for God's wholeness and justice and vindication and setting right of the world and their own lives. They long for this. They hunger and thirst for it. That it would be food and drink to them to experience something of God reconciling and healing and making things new in our own lives or in the world. Blessed are the poor in spirit, the, the mourning, the meek, the hungry and thirsty. What an altogether surprising perspective Jesus has on what an admirably good life truly is. It's so deeply counterintuitive. It's so counter to our natural tendencies of how to think about what a good life is. And maybe it makes sense only in the context of a Jesus who will go and suffer and die and rise again. Maybe uh, for Jesus' disciples, like so many things that Jesus said and did in his life and ministry, it only began to really click for them when they looked back through the lens of Jesus' death and resurrection. Because there's a dying, a dying to self involved in being poor in spirit and mourning and meek and hungry and thirsting for righteousness. There's a dying to so many of our natural tendencies. And, and, there's, and that would only make sense if it's also true that there is a resurrection hope. A resurrection hope that is not defeated by death. This is a statement of who we are. 
we are a blessed people by Jesus, especially in our emptiness, especially in our brokenness, in our hungering and thirsting and longing for another world, another creation. This counterintuitive way of living only makes sense in Jesus' upside-down kingdom. But if we're to be a Sermon on the Mount kind of people, we start getting used to being surprised by Jesus, who has a different way of approaching so many of the aspects of our lives, as we'll see as the, the Sermon on the Mount goes on. I was reflecting on this again when I read the end of Paula Poundstone's book. Her last chapter... She revisits and looks back on the whole process. She says again that this happiness is more complex than she thought it was going to be. And she says, uh, she reflects on the end that if happiness, if our happiness is going to move from something like this kind of shallow and temporary fun kind of happiness to this deep and lasting kind of happiness, maybe it has to connect, she says, to some greater good, some bigger story of meaning and purpose. And then she tells the story. She tells about a day when she was taking this meditation class where they would go and do breathing exercises and try to meditate, but she'd gotten there early, and she sat in the parking lot for a while, and she listened to a radio story about a Ku Klux Klan rally that had happened not far from where she lived, and there were counter-protesters, and fights broke out, and it told of one man, a Jewish professor, who'd thrown his body over the body of a Klansman who was being stomped and beaten with a metal pole. And as Paula went into this meditation class and sat in in silence for a while with these breathing exercises, she knew what she was supposed to be feeling, which was a kind of calm and peacefulness, but instead she was just broken. And she began to weep and sob and heave. She thought of her son and her daughter who are adopted and who are black and feeling the fear and the frustration of not being able to make this world right or good or safe for them. So in this class, when everyone's breathing and trying to feel content, she's weeping and sobbing and heaving. This was supposed to be a book on comedy. I was a little taken aback. But I was struck as I read and reflected on that moment in her story. And that moment, I I suspect, in that moment and in that way, she is not far from the kingdom of heaven as Jesus describes it. This moment of powerlessness and mourning and longing and brokenness over the world's waywardness. This, in Jesus' view, is something of what is admirable, a good life, a life that prepares the way and participates in his kingdom. And then as I thought of her story, I thought there's a pointer to that, that, to that empty blessedness, but there's also a pointer to something else because her story included this moment of reflecting on a Jewish professor offering his own life and body as a shield for someone who is wholly unworthy of it. And I thought of how in our emptiness and in our powerlessness and our moments of most deeply grieving the sin in the world and in ourselves, that we are not far from the kingdom of heaven. And then maybe we are most ready to hear about and see the message of a teacher, a Jewish teacher, And realize that it is a deeply profound happiness and blessedness that he's calling us to through his own suffering and death and sacrifice. Who are we? We're a mountain people. We're a blessed people. We're a blessed people, especially in our emptiness. We are those who are gathered through the love and the truth and the loving sacrifice of Jesus. So let's turn to him together in prayer. Gracious God, as we turn now from word to sacrament, we hear again Christ's call, come, repent, and believe the good news of the kingdom. Come and be my blessed mountain people. Come and experience the blessedness of the poor in spirit and the mourning and the meek and those who are hungry and thirsty for justice, for righteousness, and for holiness. So, Lord, we come to you empty. 
trusting in your good word and promise that those who are empty in turning to you will be filled. So come and give us food and drink at this table, not only for our bodies, but for our hearts, for our souls. Come, Lord Jesus, and feed us now. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. We come then to this table and invite our elders and our worship leaders to come forward as we prepare our hearts to join and to eat and drink at Jesus' invitation. So, dear friends, welcome to the Feast of our Lord. Jesus Christ invites all his baptized people who trust in him alone as their Savior to come hungry and thirsty to dine at this table. These words from the, this, this teaching from the Belgic Confession says that this banquet is a spiritual table at which Christ communicates himself to us with all his benefits. He nourishes, strengthens, and comforts our poor, desolate souls by the eating of his flesh, and he relieves and renews them by the drinking of his blood. So we gather, poor in spirit, hungry and thirsty, with humility and with reverence to receive this holy sacrament, and so we are moved to a more fervent love of God and our neighbors. We join together then in the prayer of thanksgiving. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right for us to give thanks and praise. It is with joy that we praise you, gracious Father, for you have created heaven and earth, and you have made us in your own image, and you've kept covenant with us even when we fell into sin. We give you thanks again today for Jesus Christ, our Lord, who by his life and death and resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. O oh Lord Jesus Christ, we remember when you came alongside the disciples on the road to Emmaus and you warmed their hearts by the opening of your word and you opened their eyes in the breaking of the bread. And so we pray that you would warm our hearts and open the eyes of faith to see and know you at this table. We join our voices with all the saints and angels and the whole creation to proclaim the glory of your name, saying together, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Amen. Dear friends, we give thanks to God the Father that our Savior Jesus Christ, before he suffered, gave us this memorial of his sacrifice. At his last supper, the Lord Jesus took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper. And said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. For whenever we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Therefore, let us proclaim our faith as signed and sealed to us in this sacrament, saying together, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Let's pray. O Lord our God, send your Holy Spirit so that this bread and cup may be for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. May we and all your saints be united with Christ and remain faithful in hope and in love. Gather your whole church, O God, into the glory of your kingdom. We pray all this in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray, saying together, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This meal is one of communion with Christ and through Christ with God. It's also a meal of communion with one another. So it's appropriate that we give greetings of Christ's peace to one another. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Receive this opportunity to greet one another. You may use the words, Christ's peace be with you, or other words of greeting. And then you may again be seated. Dear friends, welcome then to Christ's banquet table. These are the gifts of God, and they are for the people of God.
Dear friends, I invite you to come then hungry to the table of the Lord, to take, eat, remember, and believe that the body of our Lord Jesus was given for the complete forgiveness of all our sins. And dear friends, come also thirsting for righteousness. Take, drink, remember and believe that the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ was shed for the complete forgiveness of all our sins. And our hearts in thanksgiving say with the psalmist, bless the Lord, O my soul. Bless the Lord and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your life, your youth, is renewed like the eagles. I invite you then, if you would, to rise as able.
Just to note, if you're a guest with us, uh, we'd love to have a chance to interact with you after the service, get to know you. Um, there's time of cookies and coffee in the, the room off to the, be the right as you exit. Also, if you would like to have a chance to pray with someone, uh, something that the Lord has uh, laid on your heart or is going on in your life, uh, we'll have an elder who's available in the prayer room back to this side um, after the service. Likewise, if you're worshiping with us via the live stream, if there's ways we could be in touch with you or praying for you, uh, please let us know. There's contact information uh, noted there where you can reach out to us. I send you then in God's love and in God's blessing that you might go as Christ's faithful disciples into the day and into the week that lies ahead of you and into all that God calls you to. Go with God's blessing. May the God of hope fill you with joy and with peace as you trust in him so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Amen and amen.